guys this morning. I really feel like, man, I need to sit there and I need to listen to this couple minister to us. You know, they've got so much to, to teach us and it's been wonderful being in their home. You know, it's such a delight to, to come here. Like Nick says, we've known them for 15 plus years and uh, he scarred me for life. I'll never be the same after spending all those hours in the back of a vehicle with him. Uh, but that's just one of the things. I'll tell you about your pastor here this morning. And uh, I don't know if I'll ever get invited back here. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, this is my chance. I've got to take it. But um, my wife, I've met, met this beautiful lady, Daphne. This is my wife. We have six kids. And yes, we do have a TV that's working as well. Just for those of you who are wondering, uh, please don't take up an offering for a television for us. We, we sort it. And um, I, we, I went, Nick invites me to his house one day. And he says to me, hey, come over. We're going to watch a rugby and... And whatever else, I thought it kind of weird because I didn't get invited there very often, you know, um, at that stage. And so I thought, okay, let me go across to his house there and, and we're going to watch the rugby and have a great time together. And so I arrived there and I just see all of these, of some of my old friends arriving from, the, from back in the day and uh, from Secunda where I grew up and all of these guys arriving. And uh, the next minute, next minute, Nick pulls out a dummy. And one of those big, sweetie dummies that you, that you suck. And then, then a towel. Uh, and they, they, they take all my clothes off. Can you believe it? Your pastor does these things. He might look like a saint, but I'm telling you. No, he's not a sinner, but he's definitely, uh, he can get naughty. And so then they put me in this nappy, and now I've got this dummy, and I'm wearing a nappy. Then he grips me. Now, a week later, I'm getting married to this beautiful woman. He takes a shaver, and he shaves my hair. I'm getting married a week later. You did that. Don't come here with me now. It's like, oh, yeah, all right. Tell him. Yes. Still still living, but I'm healed now. Jesus healed me. I'm saved. I'm set free. I'm restored. But, uh, yeah, I shaved my head. Then he, oh, that's not even the end of it. Now, you see, the Lord is reminding me of these things. Maybe there are some unhealed wounds there. This is the morning for me. If I get set free, then it's all okay. Then he phones a friend of ours who's a, a policeman. I don't know, he was kind of high up in the police. He organizes a van to throw me in the back of this van and to put me in prison. But luckily, he couldn't organize that because it's illegal <laughs> to do such things. And um, they, st- they put me at the, at, the red, at, at the robot, at a stoplight in, in, in Pretoria. Now, at that time, it was hijackings. It was the height of all these things. And now, imagine you, you, you minding your own business. You're stopping at a traffic light, waiting for the light to change. And the next minute, as you look, there's a guy in a nappy wearing nothing but this towel and a dummy around his neck with a shaved head, and he's asking you for money. What are you going to do? You know? And so they, that's what they did to me. They made me beg at this traffic light for money so that we can go and have some drinks afterwards. And uh, we almost caused a few accidents. You know, a guy stands there, next minute I'm knocking on his window. He's like, Wah! through the red light. And so they had to pull me off the streets. And, uh, but yeah, we're here to tell the story, so it's all all right, eh? Uh, yeah, we just wanted to also just thank Nick and Viv for the hospitality, uh, for inviting us. Nick and Viv, thank you very much. You know, they've meant, they meant a lot to us in our early days when we just started out as a young couple. Um, just the input and the example they set for us was, was incredible. Uh, and I believe we're living in a, some of that blessing today. You know? um, not only have we, we've actually gone beyond. <laughs> we have six children, so it's a blessing. Just before I get into the word that I feel this morning, I, I just wanted to share a, a bit of a prophetic uh, word that I believe God has for this church at this time. Uh, and when I say this church, I really want you to appropriate it to yourself because we are, you are the church. I'm just going to pick this up. If that's all right. I don't want to walk on your notes here. You're bigger than me and you might hurt me if I do that. So um, just a, a prophetic word I felt for this church. You know, 15 years ago, my wife and I came on honeymoon to Plet. And uh, we had no bucks. We were dirt poor. Uh, I had no job. We were in love, you know. Uh, we believed love is enough. The rest will follow. And uh, we got married with zip. And so as we opened our, the envelopes people gave, you know, we said, please give us money. Don't give us presents. We really just need bucks, you know, to live. And uh, we were sitting opening the, these envelopes. And she said, how much have we got? Can we go away? You know, because we had nowhere else to go. And I said, we got a thousand rand all put together. You know, for us, that was like, wow, you know, at that stage, we can go away. We had a little Uno fire. You know those little little karikis? I remember driving down here, and every time a, a, a 16-wheeler would come past, I said, baby, hold on! And then it's like, because you know, of the wind, the, the trucks would, would generate as we went past, and we, 
Um, someone gave us their place in Plet for a week to come and stay in. And uh, we drove just the two of us in this little Uno, uh, just fearing for our lives as we came down to Plet at that stage. And when we were driving down here now, uh, about a week or so ago, uh, it struck me that here we, we go now, now we have a bus. Uh, we have a Vito, an eight-seater, uh, and it's full. When I look in the rearview mirror, I just see all these little eyes blinking at me. You know? It's like all these little heads looking back at me. And I felt the Lord say, just for this church, that, that isn't a picture for me of enlargement. It's a picture of, of, you know, this is where you were, what God has done to where you're going to go. Where you're going to go and what God is going to do into the future is going to be very different to what's gone before. It's going to, I believe, um, the enlargement that God is speaking of first happens in us. Our hearts get enlarged. Uh, God stretches it for more capacity of Him, for more of that which He wants to put into our lives. But it's not just for this church. I believe it's for this town. It's for the the surrounding towns even, that God is going to enlarge you so that He can bring more people in. And your capacity is going to increase to see more people come to Jesus uh, and to see uh, even other churches planted, other ministries started. And so I just felt the Lord say, uh, I am enlarging you and I'm stretching you. And how many of you know that sometimes in that, Place, it's not a comfortable place to be when you are stretched, when you are being enlarged. I mean, I looked at my wife, she's pregnant, she's been pregnant most of her married life, um, you know. And uh, she, every time I check that she stretches, I mean, it's an amazing thing, the human body. I thank God every time, Lord, thank you that I'm a man. But just, I, I've, I've watched my wife go, go through this process of stretching uh, to the point towards the last babies where I'm thinking, that can't stretch anymore. You know, it's like you, you, you go through that and towards the end, you're uncomfortable. You lie on this side and then you lie on that side and then you, you know, you, you, you can't just do the things. And I felt the Lord say, yes, with the stretching, there's going to be that. You are at times going to feel uncomfortable. You are at times going to feel like, Lord, what, what is happening here? Because it's out of your comfort zone. It's out of what you used to. But I feel the Lord say, just stay with it. And allow me to do it because what's going to come out is going to be the blessing. That baby gets born after nine or maybe a bit less or maybe more months and it's a blessing. And I feel the Lord say, I am going to stretch you. Yes, it's going to be uncomfortable, but what it's going to produce is going to be an incredible blessing that is going to bring joy to many. Um, And I just felt to encourage you with that. Uh, Even in those times of stretching, know that God is at work and that He is doing it. Uh, And uh, yeah, so I'm hoping that that encourages you. Can I pray for us? Is that all right? Thank you, guys. Why don't you close your eyes with me? If you have your Bibles, just hold it, or your iPad, or Samsung, or iPhone, or whatever you use uh, this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you this morning for just this opportunity to gather under the precious, awesome, mighty name of Jesus. Lord, as we sing these songs this morning of your love, God, that your love is unending, it's unfailing. Lord, we are reminded this morning that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, even this week where we've been, what we've done. Lord, this morning that we come to you, Jesus, and we come not based on our good works or what we have achieved or accomplished. We come this morning because of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ that has made a way. We thank you this morning that your righteousness has been imputed onto us, that your righteousness has been given us. And this morning, Father, we have have access to the Holy of Holies, to the place where once a year the high priest could only go has been now made open for each and every one of us. Thank you for your word this morning, Lord. Thank you for your word that enlarges us, that stretches us, it encourages us, it convicts us, and sometimes even, Lord, rebukes us because you love us, Lord God. But this morning, I pray, Holy Spirit, that your will be done here. I pray this morning that my words will fall on the the ground between these chairs, but Lord, your words, that which is of you this morning, will penetrate our hearts. And we'll produce a harvest, Father, of a 30, 60, and a hundredfold for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, as I've been praying what to share with you guys, I, I, uh, I really want to just encourage you this morning. I really felt, I said to the elders a little bit early on, I really feel like today, tonight, the Lord is wanting to just, again, breathe on us and, and, and ignite uh, some fires that may be still alive, but that are, that are maybe dwindling. For whatever reason that might be, I really felt the Lord just wanting to come and just blow over us. Uh, and uh, don't worry, it's not going to be, you think, just where is this going? It's going to be one of those weird kind of the things. No, it's not. But I really do believe God is saying, I want it to ignite. I want it to light up. I want to breathe fire on you again. 
uh, and revive that which is maybe, uh, maybe lying dormant in this season. I want to do that. And I believe this morning the Lord wants to do that uh, and tonight as well. And so I want to speak, uh, what is, I want to speak this morning on what does the world need most? I believe, friends, that the world at its worst needs to have the church at its best. The world at its worst. And right now when we look at the world, the world is an absolute just chaos. There's just uh, economic downturn and slumber. As I've spoken to some people in these areas, the effects of that. Uh, the world does not have the answers. The world doesn't know what the answer is. They think they know, but they don't. And so the world at its worst needs the church to be at its best. Then the next question has to be is, why is the church at its best? Is the church at its best when it, can, when it can offer all of the entertainment that the world can offer? I don't believe that. I believe the church at its best, that the world needs at its worst, is a church that is alive and that is full and living in, not only proclaiming but demonstrating the power of God. I don't know about you, but for me, I desire, my, my, my heart's desire is, to see in our day that which Jesus said in John chapter 14, I think around the verse 16, he says, I go to, to the Father, but I want you to know that that which I do, which you have seen me do, you will do also. I look at that statement and it floors me. It's like, God, how? You raised the dead. You walked. People touched the, the, your garment and they were healed. People, it, it, I mean, if you go look at the Gospels, what Jesus did, it was incredible. And Jesus makes a statement and he says, you will do what I did. And if that was not enough, then he goes beyond that and he says, and even greater things you will do. Even greater things you will do. Friends, when I look at the church today, I've got to say, God, we want that. Lord, we want that. We want to do that which you did. But Lord, you said we will do greater things and we don't believe that you are a liar. Friends, when I look at the book of Acts and I look at the early church, and I see what they walked in and what they did. I can see that those words of Jesus was fulfilled in the book of Acts. But man, I don't think it ended with the book of Acts church. When the church at Jerusalem stopped existing, it didn't stop there. It carries on throughout the ages and generations. And today I believe that that promise is still for you and I to live in. When I look at the book of Acts and I see the power of God and I see people being healed and restored and demons coming out of me and uh, Peter gets up and preaches, a man who before denied Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, gets up and preaches and 3,000 people are crying out, what must we do to be saved? They were cut to the heart. And it says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And it says, they were added to the church. Now, I don't know about you, but when last were any of us in a meeting where someone got up to preach and there was 3,000 people who cried out and said, what must we do to be saved? I don't know about you, but when last did you hear of someone in the church like this in a meeting says, hey, what did you get up to this week? This week I went to pray and two people got raised from the dead. I led eight people to the Lord, not as a, as a thing on my belt or as a, as a look what I did. No, because, man, if, if, if the early church did that and Jesus says we would do it and beyond, then surely it's still for us today, church. And I don't know about you, but I desire it. Am I walking in that right now? No, but I want it. If Jesus said it's for me, then, Lord, I want to walk in the fullness of that. Because, you see, when we look at the early church and we look at the church today, God is still the same. God has not changed. The Holy Spirit is still the same Holy Spirit. What has changed? The church. That's the only thing that has changed. And I, my prayer is that this morning that, man, we would, we, God would get a hold of us again and, 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 and just breathe upon us and wake us up, that we again would be awakened to the, the, to the power that is available for you and I in our daily lives. Not just when we meet here, on a Sunday morning, which is great. The Bible says in Hebrews, don't neglect the gathering together of the saints. It's important that we get together. But when we gather, it's great, the power of God, we expect it, but also when we scatter. When I'm sitting at Wimpy, when I'm at a place, where, when I'm at these different places, that's where we want to see uh, the power of God released through the church. And so in Acts chapter 2, if you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. I just want to read through this. As we lay a bit of a foundation, and we will kick into it. 
The world at its worst needs the church at its best. And we see Jesus' Jesus promise. He says, don't leave Jerusalem. Wait for the promise from my Father, which is the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost. Uh, And then Peter gets up and preaches. And uh, the power of God is released. And many get saved. But in verse 42, it says this. This was the result of a church who came into contact with the living God. This is the result of a church where the Spirit of God is alive. This is what should result if you and I call ourselves Christians. If God hasn't changed and the Holy Spirit hasn't changed and He still desires the same things for us today, then this surely should be true of us. It says here, they devoted themselves. To be honest with you, friends, a few months ago I got up in my church, I said, that's it. From now on, I will not devote any of you to nothing in this church. They were like, what? I am done devoting people. Wow, because we need, man, when, when we gather on a Sunday morning, it's not a question of, hmm, what does the weather look like there at night in the head? Should I go out there this morning or gather? No, I'm devoted. Why? Because I'm filled with the Spirit. I want to be with God's people. I want to serve God. This morning, I want to meet together with God's people. And so I said to our leaders, I said, man, stop devoting people. They must be there because they, are, they know that God has called them to be there. Amen. They devoted themselves. Why? Because they were full of the Spirit. When you're full of the Spirit, you're going to desire the things of the Spirit. If you and I are full of the Spirit and walking in the reality of this close relationship with the Holy Spirit, we will not desire something that's contrary to what He wants. Because we are led by Him and we are full of Him like Jesus was. It says, Jesus Christ, full of the Spirit, led by the Spirit. So they devoted themselves. Let me ask you this morning, are you devoting yourself? Or do you need the elders to to phone you every week and say, hey, don't forget, Sunday morning, Wednesday. No, no, we devote it. Why? Because we're filled with the Spirit. And that's God's desire. Jesus is passionate about His church, friends. It's His bride. So when I find myself un- or dispassionate, is there such a word, Ver? Where's the teachers? Unpassionate. Unpassionate. When I find myself not passionate about God's people, I have to question that in my heart. Because how will I feel like that when the Holy Spirit is passionate about it? Devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the Word of God. And to the fellowship, to the gathering, to get together, to the breaking of bread, worship, and to pray. Everyone was filled with awe. Oh, man. Are we filled with awe? And I listened to Paul sing this morning those words of the love of God and his, his, his majesty. And I stand there and I'm like, filled with awe. Everyone was filled with awe. Are we still filled with awe as we look at him, as we worship him? Filled with awe and, there, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and in, in, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is kingdom life. This is kingdom life. This is what I desire. Now, let's not kid ourselves, friends. The early church wasn't perfect, right? They weren't perfect. And just a little bit later on, you see this couple who lies to the Holy Spirit. They lie to God. God zaps them. They fall down. They drag out the one. They drag out the next one. Later on, there's complaining in the church. Are we being overlooked because they're getting more and we're not getting our food? So they weren't perfect. But you know what they had? Man, they, here's my question. I want to ask you this question. I ask myself this question. And I don't know what the answer is. I, I kind of shudder to think what the answer could be. But say, for instance, Luke had to come into this church. Luke who wrote this book of Acts and the book of Luke, the physician. Luke came in here and he said, and, and you ask him to be with you and then to write about this church. What would he write? I asked that question because Luke wrote this book, right? And he wrote on, what he, on, on eyewitness accounts and, and what happened. He wrote that on what went on. So if Luke had to spend some time in this church and then write an account of what he experienced, what would we read? 
Would, would we read something like this? I'm thinking, what would we read if he had to write about our church, North Point, after spending some time with us? Would there be anything to write? <laughs> Think about that for a moment. You know, the other Sunday, a little while ago, we were, I was preaching in the church, and uh, we have a, a very multicultural congregation. We have anything from Nigerians to Americans, you, you know, pretty much just a whole mix of just different people in the, in the congregation. And I was preaching about, I can't even remember what, what it was, but this guy was sitting right at the back, and he's, he's a wonderful man. He's a, got a heart for Jesus, but he's irritating, you know. Um, and, uh, and he knows that. But what he does is he, he comes with his shaker. Right? He comes to church with his shaker. Now, he's sitting in a section in our congregation, and uh, he brings his shaker to church. And, I mean, he loves that shaker, you know. But he's the only one that loves that shaker. So, in our worship, it's like the worship's going, and sometimes you have those moments where you, you just, it needs to be quiet, you know. There's, there's God's word, and all you hear is... And it's one of those traditional kind of Nigerian numbers, you know. It looks like something out of, anyway. Anyway, so he plays the shaker. And uh, now I think the section around him has kind of emptied out a little bit. So he's like kind of, he's still not getting the message. He's even playing it louder now, you know, I think. But um, this man is sitting in our congregation and, and the one day I'm preaching and the Holy Spirit gets hold of him in the meeting. And uh, the Holy Spirit says to him, I want you to go to the hospital. Now, where we are churches, a little bit down the road, there's a, a, a hospital called Olivedale Clinic. Olivedale Clinic is a private hospital where it's run by and owned by Indians, by Muslims. So they don't want, we have tried to get in there to go and pray for people and minister to people in the hospital because it's right in our community. If we can minister to the people there, it'll be wonderful, it'll be like an outreach. And the Holy Spirit said to him in the meeting, I want you to go to the hospital. I want you to go pray for the sick. So he doesn't know that we've tried to get into the hospital before, but there's no chance. Gets up off the church, has his coffee, goes to the hospital, he walks up to the, the front counter. Now, I don't know about you, but there is a bit of a stigma attached to Nigerians. Now, when the offering basket goes by, it's like you watch the Nigerians carefully, you know, when you take up the offering. Um, in Joburg, there's just a general thing. We, we, we joke with them all the time. It's, it's just, I mean, they, they laugh as well. It's not a bad thing. It's not a racist thing, just by the way. And so anyway, so he goes to the front of this hospital. So there's this Afrikaans tiny behind the counter, you know, and she, she looks at this guy. He says, morning, ma'am, whatever. And he, even when he speaks, you've got to listen carefully because you've got to have a well, I can't do it, but you know the Nigerian accent. So she says, he says to her, I'm here this morning. I'm, I come from a church. I've come here to, to pray for the sick people in the hospital. She says to him, well, I'm not sure about that, whatever. Let me phone my, my manager. The manager comes. He says, ah, I'm here this morning to come and pray for the sick guy says, sure. Are you alone? He says, yeah, I'm alone right now. Um, can I go in? He goes in. They allow him to go in. On a, on a, I think it was a Sunday afternoon. He goes in. During visit, visiting hours, he goes and starts praying for people in the wards. People get saved. And uh, he, he, he comes back. He says, hey, guys, I got a letter from the hospital that now allows us once a week to come in as a team and go minister to the sick from a Muslim-managed hospital. So we go into this hospital now on a weekly basis. A few weeks ago, one of our elders goes in there, and they allow us into the pediatric ward, which is amazing, where the children are. So we go in there. There's a little girl. She was about six, seven years old, and uh, she contracted some sort of a th um, virus. The night she went to bed, she was fine. The next morning, she woke up. She was paralyzed. She could no longer walk from the neck down. She had no feeling. She just, as she would try to get out of bed, she fell. Her mom picked her up couldn't walk, took it to the doctor, they did a whole thing, they said, this thing, like, only affects one in every, I don't know, millions of people, but she's got it, and the bad news is that the probability of her walking again very soon is very little, she's probably not going to walk for a very long time, there's got to be rehab and physio and, and all this stuff, she now no longer can go to the toilet on her own, you can imagine, from one day, having this healthy kid to the next day, there's, there's just nothing, and so, we go in to pray, this, this elder of ours go in to pray for her, and uh, through one man who got set on fire by God and, and went in, prayed for her, God touches this little girl, heals her. She says, Mom, I can feel my feet. I can feel my legs, Mom. 
in the hospital. Just the testimony gets out of this little girl. She now is, 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 is on, a, on a huge, I mean, the, the, the doctors are so amazed. We go to this hospital. Recently, we went there. And uh, we walk in. They're like, oh, you got other guys who prayed for that girl who got healed. That's now the testimony. Please go. And so as we leave, the staff all get together and says, where are you going? We're like, we finished. Thank you very much. They're like, no, 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 no. Can you see we're already here? Please pray for us. Amen. I it's, it's amazing how the one man, one man in the meeting who is not on leadership, he's not a de- he's not, he's, they are now deacons, eh? They were, I don't think he was a deacon then, not an elder, not in any, yet one guy, hears God, steps out in faith, opens the door for many to come to know Jesus and to get healed. Now I'm asking myself, if we have a church, if we have all of you this morning, if every one of us would get set on fire by the Holy Spirit, get a word from God, and begin to step out in faith, what is possible? What is possible in this town? What can God do with this church in this town when we set on fire? Someone once said, we need revival when we do not love him as we once did. Talking about Jesus. We need revival when earthly interests and occupations are more important to us than eternal ones. We need revival when we would rather watch TV and read secular books and magazines than read the Bible and pray. When the church dinners are better attended than prayer meetings. When concerts draw bigger crowds than prayer meetings. When we have little or no desire for prayer, we need revival. When we would rather make money than give money. When we put people into leadership positions in our churches who do not meet scriptural qualifications. When our Christianity is joyless and passionless. When we know truth in our heads that we are not practicing in our lives. When we make little effort to witness to the lost. When we have time for sports, recreation, and entertainment, but not for Bible study and prayer. When we do not tremble at the word of God. When preaching lacks conviction, confrontation, and divine fire and anointing. When we seldom think thoughts of eternity. When God's people are more concerned about their jobs and their careers than about the kingdom of Christ and the salvation of the lost. When God's people get together with other believers and the conversation is primarily about news, weather, sports rather than the Lord. When church services are predictable and business as usual, we need revival. When believers can be at odds with each other and not feel compelled to pursue reconciliation. When Christian husbands and wives are not praying together. When our marriages are coexisting rather than full of the love of Christ. When our children are growing up to adopt worldly value, value secular philosophies and ungodly lifestyles. When we are more concerned about our children's education and their athletic activities than about the condition of their souls. When sin in the church is pushed under the carpet. When known sin is not dealt with through the biblical process of discipline and restoration. When we tolerate little sins of gossip, a critical spirit, and a lack of love. When we will watch things on television and movies that are, that are not holy. When our singing is half-hearted and our worship is lifeless. When our prayers are empty words designed to impress others. When our prayers lack fervency. When our hearts are cold and our eyes are dry, we need revival. When we aren't seeing regular evidence of the supernatural power of God in our lives, we need revival. When we have ceased to weep and mourn and grieve over our own sin and the sin of others. When we are content to live with explainable, ordinary Christianity and church services. When we are bored with worship. When people have to be entertained to be drawn to church. When our music and dress become patterned after the world. When we start fitting into and adapting the world rather than calling the world to adapt to God's standards of holiness. When we don't long for the company and fellowship of God's people. When people have to be begged to give and to serve in the church. When our giving is measured and calculated rather than extravagant and sacrificial, we need revival. When we aren't seeing lost people drawn to Jesus on a regular basis, we need revival. When we aren't exercising faith and believing God for the impossible. When we are more concerned about what others think about us than what God thinks about us. When we are unmoved by the fact that 2.5 billion people in the world have never heard the name of Jesus. 
when we are unmoved by the thought of neighbors, business associates, and acquaintances who are lost and without Christ. When the lost world around us doesn't know or care that we exist, we need revival. When we are making little or no difference in the secular world around us. When the fire has gone out in our hearts and our marriages and our churches. When we are blind to the extent of our need and don't think we need revival. We need revival. So the question is, how does revival begin? How does revival come to us? You know, when I look at the book of Acts, revival started with the people of God. Revival's not going to happen in the wimpy because someone's having a coffee and a burger. Revival's going to happen with the people of God. It says they were 120 meeting together. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit came. The power of God is released. But it didn't stay in that room. It wasn't contained. It spilled out onto the streets. People looked at him and said, these people are drunk. Peter says, hey, listen, it's only this time of the morning. They, they're not drunk. This is what prophesied by Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And he begins to preach about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And what happens? Revival breaks out in that place. And so if this town is going to experience the life of God, if this town is going to come to God, you know where it's going to start? Is here with us, with the church. But it won't stay here. It will go into the streets. When we set on fire, when we are truly set on fire by God, when we are experiencing revival, we won't keep it to ourselves. It's impossible. Every revival that has ever come has not just happened in a little room where people have prayed for it. It has gone over into the streets. At Pentecost, it happened. Every revival since then, the Welsh revival, Azusa Street, every revival that's happened has happened when people have gathered. But man, from there, it has just gone out into the, into the city. And I'm trusting God that He will set us on fire, friends. That we, every one of us, will experience our own personal revival. That when any of these things I read now a moment ago is true of us this morning, that we would repent and that we would return to Him and say, God, set me on fire again so that I may be burning for you when I'm out there on the streets, in my school, at the university, and at my job. And we can see this town come to Jesus. And so how does revival begin? Some people say revival is a sovereign move of God. It's initiated in heaven. We have nothing to do with it. Other people would say on this side that revival is, yes, it's sovereign from God, but it only comes when the church is praying and seeking God and asking for it. So some people say, yes, it is a sovereign move of God. God has initiates it. He does it. We have nothing to do with it. Others would say, unless we're praying, crying out to God, seeking His face, we will not experience it. So some people say it's got to do with man. Others say it's completely got to do with God. What would you say this morning? You don't have to answer, but just think of that for a moment. How does revival come to the church of God? I believe it's both. I believe it's both. I believe it's like a train track that runs side by side. It's the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man that meets together, that, that lays these two parallel tracks where the Holy Spirit comes and brings revival. You see, some people rely so much on the sovereignty of God, they forget that they have something also to bring to this revival. And other people are so much about what we do, forget the sovereignty of God in the thing, and they don't see revival. But I believe that when we have both of those things Hand in hand, when there is a desire in our hearts and we're crying out for it, we're trusting God for it, we're on our knees praying, God, bring revival to my life. That God comes and He lays that other track next to ours and revival comes. I love what Selwyn Hughes said. He said, I believe somewhere between the opposing views of the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man lies the truth. Revival is a sovereign act of God in the sense that He alone can produce it. God alone can produce revival. But it is transported to earth on the wings of fervent, believing prayer. Every revival in history, Pentecost included, began in heaven, but flowed into the church across the ramp of intercessory prayer. The church that we have the privilege of leading today, North Point City Church in, the, in Randburg, 
Friends, there was a group of old tannies that prayed for this church. One of them is still in our church. She is now, man, she is from the dinosaur. Wow. Well, she is, careful, sorry. Babes. Please forgive me. She's a wonderful lady. We love her with all our hearts. Man, I believe we're living today in what we see. I just put that. Maybe she might listen to a recording. I don't know if it's a recording. For love you, Auntie. Auntie Pat. And she, her and a group of other ladies, man, spent every week on their knees. And not just praying quick little intercessory prayer for the church that we now lead. You know that church went from over a thousand people. It got hit so hard by man's nonsense and the enemy that it went down to like 30, 40 disgruntled people. They were literally locking the building and selling all of their land off. And these ladies prayed and said, God, you said that if we cry out to you, you will hear our prayers, you will heal our land. And they prayed and they prayed and they seek God. And you know what? God restored that church. And today we have the privilege of leading this church on seeing what God is doing. And it's got nothing to do with us. It's all got to do with God because those ladies, I want to tell you, friends, prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And I believe we are experiencing something of a revival in our church. Where people are, are getting saved and set on fire and there's, there, there, there is just life wherever we look. And I'm telling you, like I said, it's not because of us. It's because of this, of God, I believe, responding to the prayers of these ladies day after day after day in, in praying, crying out to God. He said, I believe that this view doesn't rob God of his sovereignty or man of his responsibility. He says, there's these two rails running through scripture. One is the sovereignty of God. The other one is the responsibility of man. If you keep to just the one rail, you will be derailed. Those who only talk on the sovereignty of God end up minimizing the responsibility of man. Those who end up talking only about the responsibility of man ends up Minimizing the sovereignty of God. John Wesley said this, God will do nothing redemptively in the world except through prayer. From the divine point of view, revival begins in the sovereign purposes of God. It would be true to say, I believe, that from the human point of view, it begins in the hearts of those who are burdened to see God work in an extraordinary way. Let me ask you this morning, church, do you long to see the power of God? To see the life of God flowing in and through your life? Are we hungry for this? Are we hungry to see the sick healed and the, the lame raised up and the lost saved and the dead come back to life? I am. I am. And you know what? I love hearing the stories. But man, I want to have my own stories. I want to have my own stories. Man, I love, I know Kia Taylor's been at this church, right? Kia has ministered in our church often. He's a good friend of ours. And I love to sit with Kia. And we meet with him often. I say, Kia, just tell me your stories. Tell me where we went to Africa and, and, and how, you know, on, on, on this trip that, that Nick is telling you about when we went into Tanzania. I sit down with a pastor in, in uh, Tanzania. This man must have been, I mean, he was ancient, really old. He was 90-something, uh, and he could still walk, and he would walk from village to village to village, and he would plant churches and preach the gospel at that age. And so the one day we're sitting and talking, and so now we think, hey, we're coming to minister, we're coming to give these people some handles on leadership and church government and whatever, and got the people around there. So one of the guys asked him, he says, ah, Gogo, why don't you just tell us a little bit about, about your stories, you know? So he begins to speak through a translator, this old man, he says, yeah, you know, the other day, we were just busy and there was this lightning and the lightning struck and two ladies died and they were dead and the people were crying and, 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 and they, were, they were preparing a funeral and I went there and I said, no, man, we can just pray for them. And now we're all like, you know, like, and then he said, yeah, I went over to pray for them. They were lying in the house, they're dead. I put my hands upon them, we prayed for them and they both came up and they, they came back to life. And they got up and they made us pop and we had lunch. <laughs> I'm like sitting there, I'm like, what? I say, I say now, and, and how often have you done this? He says, I can't remember. 
When the people die, they bring them, we pray, they come back to life. I'm like, I'm like, I've got nothing to teach you. <laughs> I'm like, put my notes back in my bag, you know. I'm like, so I, I say to him, how do you do it? He says to me, what do you mean, how do I do it? I say, well, tell me, how does it work, you know? I mean, I was 18 or something at that stage, when I was like 19 or, and I want to learn from this old man. So he says, he says, you know, I've got a Bible, but I'm missing so many books. He's got like parts of the, of the New Testament only. Like if, he's got like Ephesians, and then there's like no Galatians, and he's got like 1 Thessalonians. And so he's got this old Bible, missing so many pages. So he says, yeah, my Bible, the little bit that I have, tells me that you will pray for the, for the dead, and, they, and the sick, they will be raised, and the dead will come back to life. He says, the Bible says it, so we do it. I'm like, What? A man who has half the Bible is raising the dead in Tanzania because he believes what the Word tells him. And when the Word says you will pray for the dead and they will come back to life, he's doing it and he's seeing it happen. And I'm like, God, help me. That whole trip, I just wanted to, I want the lightning, just, I want to see it. You want me to send some lightning? <laughs> That's not me, but just... <laughs> I don't want to put myself out there, but I want to see him do it. The whole time I'm like, Lord, just send a bit of a storm over here, you know. I want to see this happen. But, you know, he called people. These ladies that he raised came there. So I tried to talk to them. So what did you see? A tunnel and a light and, you know, like all of these afterlife stories we hear. But it was very difficult. They, they did the translation and they, they couldn't really share much. They just said, yeah, we were dead and we were alive. That's their testimony. Amazing story. Man, I'm like, church, if we just in our own lives can believe this word of God is what he said he would do and step out because we are on fire and begin to operate in faith, we would see amazing things happen. John Wallace said this, before there can be a, before there can be a blessing, someone has to bear a burden. You see, if God is going to re reach Nazna and the surrounding areas and plate, and these surrounding areas. Who's he going to do it through? The church. He's going to do it through us. We, we sang that song, Lord, sh show your glory. His glory. It is God's intent that now that the manifold wisdom of God should be made known through the church. Ephesians 3.10 tells us that. It is through you and I that the glory of God is going to be displayed into Nazna and to the surrounding areas and wherever we go. But you see, with the, with the blessing coming to Nazna, the church is going to have to carry the burden. Am I doing something wrong? Testing one, two. Thanks, man. Great job. You see, we live in the blessing. My brother had to carry the burden of coming to sort the sound out for us. Thanks, man. But it's true, friends. I realize we pray God reach Joburg. God save Joburg. God, let your glory be manifest through in Joburg. But you know what God would say to us is, are you willing to carry the burden to make that happen? Because it's not as if God is going to show up in, in Nazna and just say, hey, all of Nazna, I'm the one, the only true God. Serve me or die. <laughs> People, the whole of Nazareth on their faces repenting. Revival breaks out. No, that's not how it's going to happen. He is going to happen through us, the church. But before there can be a blessing, the church would be willing to carry the burden. And friends, I tell you, we're experiencing something of that burden at the moment. We've been praying, God, send in the lost. Send in the lost. We had a Heaven's Gates thing last, last year already. Eh? We had 2,500 people come through our doors in six days, seven days. And the whole hundreds of them come to Jesus. After that, we're like, oh, this is messy. These people are poofy sinners, you know? They smoke, they drink, they sleep around, they steal, they, whew, this is hard work, man. It's like, what did we do, you know? We want to see people saved, but now who's going to disciple them? 
Who's going to walk? I mean, I've still got, here's my little boy here. He's 18 months. I want to tell you, this is hard work, right? Those of you who have babies right now, it's hard work. I've got to clean his nappy. I've got to wipe his snot. You know? I've got to, you know, well, my wife does a lot of that. <laughs> Just to put that out there. But I do some of it. Why? Because he's not capable to do that himself right now. It's exactly the same. If people are going to get saved in the city, become part of this church, God is looking for nappy changes and nose wipers. Are we willing to do that, church? To see them go from baby to bride, the radiant bride that he's coming back for. And so for there to be a blessing in Nazna, the church must say, God, we are willing to carry the burden. That means our time, our talents, and our treasures. It's going to take time. I've got to be at the meetings. Why? Because there are unsafe people coming that need someone to take their hand and walk with them. I'm going to have to have coffee throughout the week with these unsafe people or recently saved babies. Why? Because they need to be discipled. Jesus is going to the world and make disciples, not converts, disciples. Are we willing to put up our hands and say, pick me, like the donkey and Shrek, you know? Pick me, pick me. Or is it, okay, guys, we have all these, these recently saved people, now we need to walk with them. Who's in? <laughs> Nobody. Oh, my church, if, 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 God, if Jesus is going to bring his glory to Nazna, the church must be willing to carry the burden. You know, before deliverance came to the nation of Israel in Egypt, Moses had to bear a burden. Moses eventually cried out, Lord, kill me. Did I give birth to these people? I felt like that once or twice. Nick never has felt like that, obviously. <laughs> but Moses said, God, kill me. Did I give birth to them? I've, look, you know, how much longer are they going to go away with? Before the temple of God was built, Solomon had to bear a burden. Before the sins of the world could be removed, Jesus had to bear a burden. Before there can be blessing and the glory in Nazna, someone has to bear a burden. Are we willing, church? You know, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, it's one of my favorite scriptures when we speak about revival. It says this, if my people... Who are called by my name. My people. God's people. Who is he speaking to? The church. If my people who are called by my name. Not if some other or those people. My people. You consider yourself this morning a Christian. You consider yourself this morning a son or daughter of God. Then you are his people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. And pray and seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. What will happen? I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I will heal their land. I believe that this is a key scripture for the church in our day. He starts off by saying, if my people who are called by my name. Again, revival begins with the people of God. Not out there, it begins here with us. God is talking to those who have a relationship with him, those who carry his name. We are his first and foremost. We need to always remember that. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have received from God, you are not your own, you have been bought at a price. I would remind us again this morning, friends, that we serve a jealous God. You look throughout Scripture, right from old, right through to new, God is a jealous God. God will not share us with the world. He will not say to us, okay, from Monday to Saturday, live your life in the world, and then Sunday be mine. He wants all of us, or He will have nothing of us. He is a jealous God. He wants us. He paid the price for us. He died and bought us with his blood. The second thing he speaks about, those, if my people will humble themselves. You see, humility comes before prayer. 
It's funny that God doesn't say those who will pray and then humble themselves. He says, humble yourself and pray. Why? Because pride, friends, is one of the greatest evil that so often keeps us from doing what he wants us to do. You know, I was sharing with the guys in Plek. I walked in Checkers the other day. It's quite a while ago. I wish I had a newer story, but I don't, so I'll use the old one that I've got. I'm working on, uh, we're waiting on God to give me a new one. We should all have fresh testimonies, amen? Yeah. Shouldn't we? We should all have testimonies of what God did last week or the week before, or even yesterday or this morning. Not, you know, when I was in 1952. <laughs> Nothing wrong with those, but man, we've got to trust God for fresh testimonies. Yeah. And so I'm walking in Checkers in Joburg. Busy shopping, I'm walking with my wife. I think we had some of our kids there. You know, when you shop, it's quite a, a task. You've got to do a head count every 10 minutes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, they're all with us. Let's go, you know. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, one is missing. Oh, there he goes on the little, you know. The shopping centers, I'm telling you, the devil has got a scheme against us parents. Have you been to those shopping centers? And what they do is, is they put the trikes out on the floor of where the toy aisle is. They put them there purposefully to torment us as parents. And so when we count, one, two, three, four, five, where's Matthew? Matthew's on the other side of the shop going on this bike. Woo! You know? And we're chasing after him, running after him. And so we're walking in checkers. So I'm walking, minding my own business. I'm not talking to anyone. My wife's doing shopping. I'm kind of helping with the kids. And I feel the Lord say to me, you see those people over there? I want you to pay for their shopping. What? I'm like, you know, sometimes you think, I, I tell you, friends, we need to be more obedient and immediate about the voice of God. How many times have God spoken to us and we think it came from, it came from our heads? And I thought that it came from my head. So I'm like, dismiss it. I'm like, oh, whatever, you know, I'm like, that's not God. God went, what? So he says to me again, he says, hey, I spoke to you. You see those people over there? I want you to pay for their groceries. I'm like, so now it's like, I felt God has spoken twice, you know. Now you don't want to be disobedient, especially not to the Lord, you know, so... I go to my wife, I say, babe, I don't think God just spoke to me about paying for those people shopping. So my good wife looks at me and says, so why are you talking to me about it? <laughs> God spoke to you, go and do it, you know? So it's so helpful. So I'm like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing. But now it's tricky because the shop's busy, and so i got to kind of like, i got to get my timing right at the till. It doesn't help they 10 people ahead. I'm like, hey, I'm paying for your shopping. <laughs> so it's like, Call the loony police, you know. Take him back to the institution. So he, now I've got to follow them because I've got to get there when they pay. So now I'm like, they're walking along. And he's a big guy, right? He's like a fris, I think, as an Afrikaner, Blue Bull supporter. Eats Texan steaks for breakfast with his two kids and his wife. So they're walking. So I'm like following them you know, in the shopping mall. So I'm like, I'm like this, like, sort of like, dun, 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 like behind the pillars, you know. I'm like... So I check, they look at me like, now they've noticed me. Now I'm like, oh, flip. What do I do now, you know? But now I can't let them out of my sight because just now they're gone. So I'm like following from a distance. Every now they look, I look at the Vienna, and <laughs> this thing. And, and so eventually we get our timing. So I say to my, my wife, okay, we need to get in behind them. Let's, let's go. So we push in. So now the oak is a little bit, you can check. He's like, I think you think I'm, I'm chopping his chick, you know? So <laughs> this is like dangerous ground here. I'm like, I might meet Jesus in an instant. When he grips me, he's going to kill me. So we get in behind this guy. So he looks at me. So I'm, I go up to him and I talk to him. So he's already a little bit like, what, what kind of, what do you want? You know? So I think, can I please pay for your shopping? He looks at me like I've just told him something ugly about his mother. You know? So I'm, he's like, what? So I'm like, please, can I pay for your shopping? He's like, no, forget it. You know? It's like that, I mean, we all have that bit of pride in us, don't we, right? Yeah, of course we do. I'm my own man. I do my own thing. I'm my own shopping. Who are you? So, so I say, but can I please, I insist, can I pay for your shopping? And he's like, no. So now I know. Now I've got I to gotta pull the Jesus card here. You know? So this, this is already weird. Now, if I tell him, Jesus told me. Oh, well, this oak is going to, he's going to be like instant. This oak has lost it. So I say to him, so, uh, you know, I don't know who you are, you know me, but I, I really want to pay for shopping. I believe Jesus has, has asked me to do it, thinking that I'm waiting for that. I mean, his hand could probably wrap around my head, <laughs> meet the other side, and just screw it off like a light bulb. So he, he looks at me, and immediately he just like, he, he goes all like, like soft inside, you know? It's like, did Jesus work? So he's like, 
He's like, well, okay, if you want to. You know? And as, I, as I'm just paying for the few items, um, his wife starts crying. Right there at the till. Public. I mean, it's busy. The shop's going. She starts tearing. Tears start running down her eyes. The two little kids off to the side, kind of maybe 10, 13 year old. Um, and he starts crying. Here's this big grown man in the shopping mall just having a moment. We, I believe the Holy Spirit's breaking into their lives. You know, so we pay, they go off. Now he's waiting there at the thing. I'm like, oh, Lord. So I'm like, <laughs> I made him cry now. What is going to happen now? To me? So <laughs> I walk up to the guy. So I say to him, um, I didn't say anything. He comes to me, he shakes my hand again. He's like, fingers come up to here. You know, it's like shakes my arm. <laughs> this massive man. So he, he says to me, um, you might not know this. He's, he's like tearing, you know, very emotional. He says, my wife and I came shopping here today, and this was our last money that we had. And we decided we we're going to buy these few items, and they were buying like a cheap packet of biscuits, some, I think it was um, beans and a bread, stuff that, you know, when, you, when your month is too long at the end of your money, that those are the sort of things that you just, you can afford, so you buy them. And, and he just said, we've run out of money, and we were going to buy our last bits now. Um, and then we had nothing left. And Jesus met him in a shopping center. Right there. And I'm thinking, God, how often have I missed you? How often have I walked and be so preoccupied with me and myself and my business and that which I do, that, Lord, when you have reached out to touch people, I have turned around because I thought it is me and not you. And he phoned me, he took my number, he insisted on getting my number. I gave him my number. He phoned me after that a few times. And uh, just again, say, look, thank you. I don't, know, I don't know what to say. Eventually I said, please, don't thank me. You know, just it's... But man, did that family know that God is real that day? And that Jesus loves them? Because someone took the time to, to step out... Of, I, it was incredibly uncomfortable for me to do that. It was difficult. And so you see, when a blessing needs to come to our city, we're going to have to step out of our comfort zone. We're going to have to step out of that which we think is, is our safe place so that God can be manifest and made known to our city. And why I'm saying that, friends, is that it's going to take humility. It's going to take humility. Pride is what will stop us from walking in the fullness of God so often. You know, the devil was kicked out of heaven. Why? Because he was full of pride. And I believe so often we miss the heart of God because of our pride. You know, we need to know this, friends. It's not about, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. And when we make it about us, oh, I didn't like that song that Paul chose, that second song. He didn't sing it. He was off key. Oh, man, it's so cold in the hall. There's no electricity. Oh, man, it's like, you know. It's about us. It's about us. It's about us. No, guys, we've got to lift us and say, it's not about me. It's about Jesus. In James 4, 6, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. How many of you know that we need the grace of God? We need the grace of God. If my little boy was here, Matthew, this is what God, when we're full of pride, God does this. If I had my little three-year-old Matthew, and I said, okay, Matthew, hit me. He would love that. <laughs> Say, this is what I've been waiting for, Dad. Now let me hit you. So if I hold him on his head like this, I don't have to use too much force. He can do what he wants to. He is not going to hit me. And he can come and he can try and fight his way and he can try and punch me, but I'm just going to hold him there. And sometimes that's us and God. When we're full of pride, he simply just puts his hand on us. And we're trying our best, whatever, whatever it is. Why is it not working, Lord? Why is something not? Why? Because... Man, I've got to deal with my pride. God resists us when we're full of pride. But man, he gives grace to the humble. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Number three, and pray. And pray. Pray, church. Are we a praying church? Praying church. You know, it speaks here about not a selfish prayer, simply for what we want. This is intercessory prayer, without ceasing, praying until we have what we believe in God for. Prayer 
is cooperation with God. Not bending God's arm or His will to ours, but ours to His. And I love what He says here, and seek my face. Not my hand. Now, I believe there's nothing wrong with seeking God's hand. Absolutely not. He's our Father. He loves to provide for us, right? The Bible tells us, I am Jehovah Jireh. I am your provider. He is our source. He is our provider. But how often do we seek the hand and not the face? And I think sometimes God would say to us, Jan, if you would seek my hand less and my face more, boy. You know, if my children only came to me when they wanted something. Oh, Dad, can I have 10 bucks? Oh, Dad, can I have this? Oh, Dad, can I have that? Right? And never would take the time just to hang out with me. It would break my heart. But I think sometimes that could be us in our prayer life and in our walk with God. It's Lord, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. Amen, can I have it, please? Off we go. And God says, hey, seek my face, my presence a bit more than just my hand. I delight to provide for you, but you know what I delight also in is to, to have you with me in prayer, in intimacy. Let's spend some time together. So he says, and seek my face. And then five, and you might say, Jan, why are you preaching this to the church? Because I believe this is a word that the church also needs to hear as well as the world and turn from their wicked ways. Are you trying to say that there could be wicked ways in the church? Absolutely. Absolutely, friends. You know, sometimes we, we, we are involved with things we shouldn't be. We expose ourselves to things we shouldn't. And what we are so good at doing sometimes when we do the things we shouldn't do is to justify why we're doing them. And so I would sit with people, I'm like, why are you doing that? Oh, because this happened to me or because that. No, no, it's sin. We need to repent. And God is looking for a church that is constantly repenting. Constantly walking before him in purity, saying, yes, Lord, I've messed it up. I've blown it. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. I'm leaving that thing. I'm turning away from it. I'm walking the other way. That's repentance. And I believe God is saying, I'm looking for a church that has repented this. We gossip. We condemn others. We watch things that we know does, not, does nothing for our souls. We make money more important than God, and we sin. Although we are the people of God, we can be guilty of sinning against the Lord. And I believe this morning that if we are going to live in the blessing, there needs to be a genuine repentance in our hearts. You know, if we do those things, that's what we do. We pray, we seek His face, we repent, we humble ourselves, then God made this promise. He said this, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sin, and I will heal your land. Ah, wonderful promise. You see, again, here's this divine partnership of the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man in bringing revival to Nazna. Is that, church, we are called to do these things. Then God will do what he said he will do. He said, I will hear, I will forgive, and I will heal. We close our eyes for a moment. Thanks, Lord. I want to just give us a moment this morning, friends, just to, to look at our lives, my life, your life, just you and God this morning. I really believe that it is God's heart that we live in revival. Personally and corporately as a church, but in our own lives as well. And this morning, I want to pray for you. I want to I trust that with you this morning, where you know that the, the flame has grown dim, where you know that you, know, you no longer love him as you once did. And when I went through that whole list, I hope that halfway through you didn't dial out, but that you... That some of what I said there in the beginning of we need revival when these things are no longer happening or are happening that shouldn't be happening. We need revival in our lives. 
I think being a Christian and born again and spirit-filled must be absolutely one of the most exciting things to be and to have in our day and time because the opportunities are everywhere. People are grasping for things that, that has no substance and they're realizing that they're empty. But man, you and I carry within us the presence and the power of God. And if you're here this morning and you say, yeah, and this morning I'm trusting God again to be set on fire that I can be like the church in Acts. See the power of God manifest in and through my life. Won't you stand with me? I'm standing. I'm responding to this word myself. And I'm going to pray with us in a minute. And ask the Holy Spirit. He's the one who baptizes. He's the one who fills and ministers to us. We want Him to do it. In responding to your word this morning, Father, we now come. If you're comfortable, won't you just raise your hands with me, please? If that's all right. Just in a, an attitude of, of receiving from Him this morning. Light the fire again, God. Light the fire again. Let us see you this morning as you are exalted, risen, seated at the right hand of the Father. Lord, where there are flames this morning that are flickering and have grown dim and about to go out. Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray now, would you breathe, would you, would you release life? Right now, I just believe the Holy Spirit is touching some people here this morning. Just be hungry. Be hungry for Him. Be hungry for Him. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Just wait on Him a moment. Don't hurry on. Or intimacy being restored to some hearts here this morning. I feel like some people have wandered wandered away. God says, this morning, I'm drawing you back. I'm receiving you back. Prodigal son. Prodigal son, it's time to come home. It's a matter if you've been with the pigs. I still love you. I still love you. You're still my son. Nothing has changed that. Your identity is, is secure. It's set. You have wandered away, but my arms are open this morning. I feel the Lord is saying that. I have sat and I have looked for you for the day of your return. And today I receive you back as my son, my daughter. Just receive from him, friends. Receive from him. And I believe on the laying on of hands. I believe in impartation. I believe in those things. It's all biblical. But also believe that God is sovereign and that where you are standing right there, the Holy Spirit is ministering to your heart right now. Revival, revival, revival. Revive hearts that have grown tired. Some of you, I feel, believe that the price has become too much to pay. Restore the joy of our salvation, God. Restore the joy of our salvation today. The joy, the joy, the joy of serving you, God. Where it's become a drag, where it's become a, an effort, God. This morning, restore the joy. Restore the joy of serving you, our King. Just as we continue to stand, um, is Susie around? Susie, are you here or is she? Can, is it possible just to release her for a minute to just come through? I really felt I just had a word for her. Just to continue to focus on the Lord, friends.
Baby, won't you come? Step you know, I was praying just in, in preparation for our trip to Pleton here, um, maybe about two weeks ago or so, and uh, the Lord showed you to me. And now, this has never happened to me before, where I had such a clear picture. And so when we went to Plet, I looked for you. I looked for, but obviously you, you were here. You know? So I thought I had missed it. It wasn't God. And uh, then when we came to Nick's house and you were there, I was so overjoyed. I just saw, I, I, I just had such a picture, you know, of, of, your, of your hair and your face. And, and um, I just felt the Lord would say to you uh, in this time is that I read that um, Ezekiel 47, uh, where he says, I see this river you know, flowing from the throne, the presence of God. And uh, he says, I, he led me ankle deep and knee deep. And then I went up to my waist. And then it was a place, a river that I could not cross as I was fully into this river. And I felt the Lord say to you, Susie, it's time to, to get fully into the river. You know, I felt there's times when you've, when you've let go, where your feet no longer have touched the, the bottom and you've gone, but it's, and, and you've enjoyed moments and you've gone back to the safe place. You've gone back to the place where you're in control, where, where you can feel there's solid ground under your feet. But I feel the Lord say, it's time to let go and, 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 and let Him. You know, when you're in that river and it flows, and you, you can't touch, you, you're at the mercy of that river. You go where the current and the, and, and the water will take you. And I feel the Lord say to you is that it, this is the season on your life. He's in control and he will, he will watch over you. Um, why don't you come stand with your wife and just I pray this over you guys. I feel, you know, it's just, it's a season of, of man, and I use these words carefully because I know that they, but I feel like there's, there's almost a sense of let go and let God. A, a, a full reliance and trust in Him in this season. To say, God, we're letting go. We're in this river. We are yours. Take us. God says, I'll do it. My hand is on you. Father of all wisdom, I just pray this morning. Thanks, Jan. We'll be back at five o'clock this afternoon. Bring us a bit of plate of food.